One of the fundamental assumptions we make is that data is independent and identically distributed. And that identically distributed assumption, we're assuming that all the data that we're working with for analysis is coming from the same parent distribution. Um, but we know that that can be a really tough assumption to meet um, due to non-stationarity changes in the data over time and to things like climate change. And so that's what we're going to talk about today uh, is some climate change topics and non-stationarity. And then at the end of this presentation, we're going to go through an overview of how the Corps of Engineers incorporates climate assessment, climate change findings within their studies. So we'll focus on describing non-stationarity, uh, non-stationarity context, summarizing the current tools and guidance that we use, um, initial data analysis, concepts and how they apply to flood frequency, and also just our existing Corps of Engineers qualitative climate assessment approach. So I know Jake and Aaron work in the climate change cop world a little bit. Is there anybody else in the room that works on any kind of climate change stuff as part of their work? Okay, yeah. So no, that's that's really interesting here because you know, 10 years ago the answer would probably be nobody or it'd be like Will Veach, who's now like the CPR cop lead. <laughs> So we're working towards finding better ways to incorporate changes from climate change into how we do risk assessments and approach risk too. So like I said at the beginning of the presentation, one of the fundamental assumptions we make with any data set is that it's independent and identically distributed. Um, and to be identically distributed, all that data has to come from the same parent distribution and that parent distribution statistical properties like mean standard deviation variance uh, can't vary with time. So as we're getting more and more data and we're looking at more and more of the information we have, those properties fundamentally should be the same. Um, if they do, if there are any kind of jumps, trends, periodicity, we term that non-stationary because those fundamental parameters that we use to describe the distribution and define the distribution aren't the same for different periods of time. So that's essentially what non-stationarity is. And there's a complicated formula up there, but that just basically means that the mean is constant if you integrate over all time. <clears throat> and this is just another definition of non-stationarity. Um, what's interesting is you know, we do these tests on things like the mean and the standard deviation variance to look at how they change over time, but really what non-stationarity is driving at is the, the random stochastic processes that generate flows. And so those are the processes that are actually non-stationary. And we kind of define non-stationarity using terms that we can grasp, like the mean and the standard deviation and variance. And so what this really gets at is when these things are changing, it means we actually need to be cognizant of the fact that um, our flood driving mechanisms are changing. And that's really the alarming part that's relatable to developing hydrologic hazard curves is how are those processes changing? because that's going to impact the discharges that we see at our dams and levees and other infrastructure. And that's just a, another definition. So here's what non-stationary looks like. Um, this is just a really basic example of, you can see here, flood magnitude, annual instantaneous peaks over time uh, with a trend line fit to it. And then this is just a, a summary of these distributions from the beginning point to the end point. They should be superimposed on there, but they're not. But what you can see here is that in this hypothetical example, they kept the scale and shape parameters, so like the standard deviation skew, the same. Um, but you can tell that the location has changed between the beginning of the project, in this case, and the end of the project. And so what this would show is like on average, our, our mean is going up and we're experiencing higher flows than we used to in the past. And why this is really an issue is because if that assumption of IID, independent and identically distributed, is violated, that means we could be severely underestimating or overestimating our hydrologic hazard and therefore our risk. And so the authors of Bulletin 17C, including John England, they recognize this fact uh, that this could become kind of an issue. And so they built the language in the Bulletin 17C that says that this is intended to be a flexible approach and that you can use other approaches based on the information that you have, the state of the science at the time, uh, and you know whatever technology that you have. So like when at the RMC, that's why we use the Bayesian approach for some of our hydrologic hazards estimates is because the language in 17C is actually flexible enough to allow for that. The other interesting thing is when they're writing this, and even at this time, 
the Corps of Engineers and you know, nowhere in the world has climate science advanced to the point where we can say, OK, we can do projections of future climate and actually get usable information for what floods are going to be like. You know, we can look at weight of evidence with data from those projections, but we can't say, OK, for the expected climate conditions that we've had, this is how floods are going to change. And then we can quantify that and use it in our impacts. So every day, month and year, we get more and more information about climate. There's more research being done on climate change and they're working towards that. But that's a really tough question to tackle. I know that the Corps of Engineers is actually talking about that with you know, our headquarters. Uh, they're working with climate scientists. They're actually hiring for a senior climate scientist, if you know anybody at IWR. <laughs> um, but that's the big question now, is how can we quantify those changes and actually incorporate them? <laughs> and so Bulletin 17C left some of this language open so that as the science progresses, even if this document's not updated, you kind of have authority or, you know, if you have good science and good information to utilize that information in your estimates for hydrologic hazard. So before conducting any kind of a frequency analysis, um, you should always do a cursory analysis on your data. So at minimum, you mean you should be plotting the data, you should be trying to do some basic trend analysis and some statistical tests to check whether or not that data set meets your assumptions of independent and identically distributed. There's a lot of research out there on how climate change is actually impacting flood hydrology. Uh, this slide just summarizes some of the Huck watersheds in the United States where the USGS has papers and studies. And so some of these resources that you can access in the slides um, or just Google uh, will actually take you directly to specific studies that the USGS has done to look at how hydrology is changing in the area. So we're just going to look at a couple of quick examples. So this first example here uh, is for, I have a tough time reading that, the Susquehanna River at Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And so just based on visual inspection, like is there anything you notice that's a little bit weird about this? Like if you were looking at this data set and you were gonna come up with an inflow volume frequency curve, what, what's the first thing you see that kind of was like, what's going on there? Yeah, exactly that. <laughs> so. You know, just because we see some weird flood stuff doesn't necessarily mean it's climate related and it can be very challenging to separate what those climate signals are in our flow records. But here is we have predominantly normal riverine driven flows, but then Hurricane, Ag Hurricane Agnes happened. And so that data point there, um, that doesn't necessarily mean there's some kind of weird climate signal. It means that potentially this is a mixed population. So we've got normal rainfall driven events driving most of the floods but then you get some of these like tropical cyclones that work their way north or hurricanes and you can end up with these massive flows and like you see this like in Derrick's region in the eastern region all the time where you have like a flood record like this and then one or two massive hurricanes <laughs> on top of some already wet conditions and it just you have to be cognizant to the fact that the things that are driving floods like this are different than what are driving floods like this it may or may not have anything to do with climate change. In these types of cases, we often are still including this in our overall analysis because it's a single data point. Because, I mean, if we took this out, like this does have a significant impact on our risk. But like, if you do want to do a mixed population analysis, like I'm from the, the Midwest or up in Minnesota, and we have snowmelt driven flood events are really common. And then we also have rain on snowmelt, and then we also have rainfall events. Um, and when you separate those out, you, what you're supposed to do is separate them out by flood driver. You basically do a flow frequency analysis and you can combine them using probability theory to get an overall estimate. That's the recommended approach. But you still need enough data to do that. You know, you, if you separate this out by all these rainfall driven floods and then this, you can't do anything with a single data point. <laughs> oh. Yeah, so like it, it almost looks like there's a slightly lower trend potentially, but also like if you look at the latter half of the period of record versus the former, the variance is a lot higher too, right? Like the spread and the flow events that you're seeing, there's a much greater range going on there. Um, so these are just things to look at. So there, there could be some potential issues with non-stationarity in this data set. Here's the Gila River. Uh, what do you see going on here? You've got kind of low variance here, then, a massive upshoot and then things are just plummeting. <laughs> 
you know, this, this doesn't look like a good stationary data set. I would be willing to bet that there's some kind of a trend going on, means changing, standard deviations definitely changing if you look at this over time. So, but the point of this is you can tell a lot just from looking at the plots and what's going on with your data sets. And so these are just things to look out for and be aware of. Then here's one more. So this one's, I went to school in Fargo, North Dakota and got to experience uh, these three floods. Um, this is the Red River of the North at Fargo. And to my knowledge, this is one of the few studies that the Corps has done for a major construction project. Essentially, they're gonna be building a 19 mile, $2.2 .2 billion diversion around the city of Fargo to reroute the Red River during floods. And this is one of the few projects where they took a look at this plot and said, we can't use the whole period of record to do flow frequency for this, because if we include all of this, we're really gonna be underestimating our current risk. And so they actually got a panel of experts in the room, including people from IWR and HEC, and they sat down and they decided, okay, they did a bunch of statistical tests, they looked at all the evidence, they looked at the climate records that they had and atmospheric science available. And they said, we're gonna limit the period of record for development of involved flow frequency curves in support of this project from 1942 to 2009. We're gonna use this higher chunk. And even within that chunk, there's a trend evident that things are going up. And so, this is the kind of information to look at when you're making decisions on what you want to use for a period of record, because this definitely wasn't homogeneous. I know I'm running a little long. <laughs> yeah. This is just a, another couple of slides on some tests that you can do. So generally, we recommend doing like a trend analysis, main candle trend test, or just a simple linear regression. Um, for our preliminary analysis, we usually you know, we assume a null hypothesis for these trend tests that there is no trend. And then if we get a p-value of less than 0.05, uh, that means that there's strong evidence that the trend is not correct and that a trend does exist. And so we use that as like a precursor. Um, just note that p-values, you know, Ronald Fisher came up with these in like the late 1800s, early 1900s. He said a value of 0.05 and we've kind of taken that and run with it. So if you're doing a more detailed study, you might actually want to put more thought and effort into what p-value you use to find significance. So the Corps of Engineers currently has climate change guidance falls into two categories and how we incorporate this. So the first is for sea level rise. We're not going to cover a lot in here because it's actually fairly detailed, but they actually do try to quantify based on all the sea level data they have, um, how high you need to build things based on projections for sea level rise. And so these engineer regulation and engineer pamphlet, if you have questions about that, um, provide a lot of good overview on what you need to do. So if you have a project that's less than 50 feet NAVD88, you have to incorporate sea level change into your analysis to look at how it's gonna impact that. Most of our dams are, are inland and higher up. So we're actually gonna focus on the inland hydrology aspects, aspects of this today. So the Corps of Engineers' current guidance is to adopt a weight of evidence-based approach with climate change for a qualitative climate change assessment. And that consists of a literature review, trend analysis of data that you're interested in looking at, non-stationarity detection, uh, a climate hydrology assessment, which is actually a projection of future climate, and then also a vulnerability assessment. And so those are split into two broad categories of looking at what's changed in the observed records and then what do our climate models say is going to change in the future? So the first step is to do a literature review using available peer-reviewed science. And so these have to come from you know, journal articles like the Journal of Hydrology or Meteorology um, and should have some level of review, but also a lot of state-level agencies like the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources has a really great climate change program where they publish information. So like if I'm doing a study in Minnesota, um, that information is really good to use. But what you're trying to look at is like, if you're interested in flooding, how has precipitation changed over time? You know, how do changes in temperature influence precipitation? Uh, and kind of figure out like what's really going on in your region, because the impacts from climate change really do vary quite a bit from region to region. And the second is to do trend analysis of observed data. So, you know, we're always looking at floods. So again, you wanna use unregulated data if you can, because you wanna be able to fit a distribution to it and you wanna see what's happening with those random stochastic processes. Cause the underlying thing that causes non-stationary are changes in those stochastic processes. And we summarize that by looking at the mean and standard deviation um, over time. And so you can do 
<clears throat> just basic trend analysis. You can use Excel. Otherwise, the Corps of Engineers actually has tools for this too, or you can upload your own data sets and it'll automatically spit these values out using a variety of different tests and look at, is the trend increasing, decreasing, staying the same? Is that trend statistically significant? Does it have a p-value of less than 0.05? That all tells you some evidence about how strong uh, these changes are and whether or not your data set's actually homogeneous. So the first iteration of the course tools for non-stationarity analysis is called the non-stationary detection tool. Uh, which only looked at peak flow. There's now a time series toolbox where you can look at any hydrologic vari or any variable at all that you want to upload. Uh, but essentially, the non-stationarity analysis tool runs something like 13 different statistical tests using a variety of parametric and non-parametric methods to look for changes in the mean, changes in the standard deviation and variance, change in the magnitude, and also change in the distribution. And so what we typically do is upload like our entire annual instantaneous peak flow record and then run this tool. And we have three criteria that we've established, consensus, robustness, and magnitude, to identify whether or not there's a non-stationarity in the record and if it's considered strong. So any of these alone is considered a non-stationarity because these tests are flagging it as there being a change. In this case of the mean, it was the light blue, uh, or sorry, the mean is the dark blue, light blue is distribution, and yellow is variance. And so when we talk about whether this is actually strong or not, um, we look for consensus, robustness, and magnitude. And consensus means that two tests that are looking for changes in the same type of parameter, like the mean or the standard deviation, detect a change. Um, robustness means that at least one test detects a change in the mean and one de test detects a change in either the standard deviation or the distribution over time. And then magnitude is, you know, for different chunks of the data, are we actually seeing significant increases in the mean or the standard deviation? So if it meets this criteria, that's considered a strong change point and pretty strong evidence that the record is not homogeneous and would not meet that identically distributed assumption that's critical for our analysis. Another tool is the climate hydrology assessment tool. And so this tool only used to do flow, but now it actually does all the variables listed up there, uh, different types of flow, precipitation, uh, and temperature. And essentially what it's doing is it's taking, I think, 64 different general circulation models, which are climate models that project climate change into the future, and it's downscaling them. And you can actually get results at the stream segment within your Huck eight-digit watershed. And it just looks for trends. And so it's got a hindcast period from about 1950 through 2005. And then 2006 through 2099, it looks at how climate has changed. So this hindcast period is actually looking at historical data and it's doing its simulations. And you can see that it tries to match a trend line to what we've seen in the past or what it's, sorry, it tries to match a trend line to the model outputs. And then it also has, okay, but when we consider in like greenhouse gas emission scenarios, um, what does that do to the climate? And so you can look for trends here too. And again, you're using some of those same tests, like are these changes statistically significant? Are they increasing magnitude? Are they decreasing magnitude? Uh, no, so that's actually built into the software as the hindcast period. I, I don't know the history of that, whether that's like when the CVENT models came out, but the hindcast period that they're using is there. And I think, at least in earlier versions of the tool, you had some leeway on how you set that hindcast period. So, but I can, I can dig into that a little bit more why that is. I know the user's manual says something about that. So, yeah, that's the default in the tool though, is, yeah. In the very early version of the tool, they set it at 2000, <laughs> so. But all it really is, is like, this is kind of a, a warm up period using historical observed climate data. We run that through our models and we get simulated results for the historical period. And then when we factor in the fact that we have increased greenhouse gas concentrations, how do those changes look? So you can kind of compare what happened in this chunk to this chunk and whether or not those trends are significant. And then the last is a vulnerability assessment tool. So for each four digit Huck watershed in the United States, um, you can look at different business lines, like the most common one I look at is flood risk reduction. And it's got variables 
that make up this weighted order, weighted average score. And essentially it ranks all the watersheds in the United States. I think there are about 202 four digit Huck watersheds and it flags the most of the top 20% as being especially vulnerable to impacts of climate change. So some of those indicator variables that go into these scores are like more runoff, uh, more precipitation, things like that. Um, it's important to note that the tool only flags the top 20% of watersheds is vulnerable by default, but you know that doesn't mean that just because you're in the 21st percent you're not vulnerable to the impacts from climate change. And you only have access to this tool if you're a core employee, so <laughs> it's just so everybody knows it's out there. And then the last part of a qualitative climate assessment is kind of bringing it all together. So like I said, it uses a weight of evidence based approach. And so you take a look at what the literature review is saying. You take a look at your original data and your trend analysis that you've done in your data. You look at your results from your non-stationary detection analysis. You look at what the projections are saying and you try to build a case for how do you think climate change is actually gonna impact things in your region. And then most of our projects, at least if we're doing like a PED project, we try to figure out what project features we're building in, like maybe a levy and a flood wall or engineered high ground and a railroad raise in this case. And we try to think about the triggers, hazards, harms, the likelihood of that happening and what the impact would be and incorporate those into our planning process. And this is still a pretty active discussion in USACE about how to incorporate these types of information into a risk assessment. Uh, but the big takeaway is these climate assessments, uh, I think they're required for all higher level risk assessments, right? We talked about definitely, yeah, definitely required for bond studies. But in some cases, if you, based on this study, see strong evidence that climate change is really active and influential in your region, you can elevate that. And there are cases where like the CPR COP has gone into a quantitative study. And it's difficult though, that's an active area yeah. of research right now. It's not something that's common, but like that Fargo example was a good one. You know, they're like, we can't use the whole period of record. That would be very bad. <laughs> and remember for our dams, the modifications that occur are either like a geotechnical failure, which climate is not really gonna affect, right? Or it's the upper, very upper end, the very maximum precipitation. We're already at the extreme end with some wide uncertainty. Yeah. What is the climate cop? I mean, what's the climate assessment really gonna how much more can it really add to that extreme value with high uncertainty already? Um, so that's a, a big part of doing the literature review is trying to figure out like how is climate change playing a role in addition to like just the natural atmospheric phenomenons and science that go on in your area. So 